evening, everyone. Happy quarantine. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Get the Fork Out. Uh, this is a two-part episode with my good friend Eduardo Garcia, a ex-yacht chef turned entrepreneur, and uh, he's a very interesting tale of woe that he has flipped on his head and turned it into this kind of tale of inspiration. Many of you might have heard of him. He did a documentary called Charged about his accident where he basically, to cut it short, um, I'll let you watch it. It's really good. It involves an outdoorsman seeing something interesting and touching it with a knife. We'll go from there. Again, stay for part two. Yeah, next week. Tune in for part two. Get the Fork Out. Eduardo Garcia, welcome. This is uh, Get the Fork Out. It is an absolute honor to have you, my friend, here uh, just have a little chat, catch up a little bit in front of these fine folks and talk about you know, your time in yachting and uh, your time outside of yachting, your entrepreneurship, and I don't know, just basically uh, introduce people to you and, and your story. I think it's a fascinating one. So, welcome. Thanks, Chef. Appreciate you having me, man. It's uh, always it's always a treat to connect with you uh, over. I feel like we're counting almost double decades at this point. Um, yeah, our connections there. have right. Our connections yeah. have have kind of run the gamut from handoffs in the middle of the ocean for spare parts to connects, you know, in, in social circles around the world, all the yeah. way to here in, in this, uh, you know, in this virtual space. And then, and then also as, um, as just individuals, friends, uh, and, and then our business owners and creatives. And, uh, I, it's always, uh, an invite that I'll take. So I'm stoked to be here with you, man. Oh, I appreciate you, my friend. It's uh, it's an honor. You uh, like we met. A little uh, brief background from from my side. We met about 20 years ago in San Diego with our friend mm -hmm. Brent Willett in a VW bus, and just sat by, sat around the fire, uh, had a couple beers, smoked a couple puffs off a joint, and just chilled out and got to know each other. It was awesome. I said two, two decades ago, like I said. Yeah, I believe we we both started on our first yachts uh, on the very same day. I think it was, or, or within, you know, within within the same week. It was Halloween uh, week, two thousand one, two thousand, yeah, something like that. You were on uh, Dorothea, and I was on Magic Time. Magic Time, that's right. Magic Time. <laughs> what, what, uh, tell us where your uh, your yachting career went went from that that instance. Uh, 20, let's see, I was 20 years old. I just graduated cooking school. Um, and, uh, it was a 107 foot wooden motor yacht in Shelter Island, San Diego. And, um, gosh, it's giving me, giving me uncomfortable, exciting, anxious little boy chills right now. Just even thinking about it. I mean, I was like fresh off, fresh out of school had never called myself a chef. I, I had been a line cook, yeah. a pastry cook, like I had been a cook, punch in, punch out cook. And I uh, had a fresh sort of degree in my hand um, in the culinary arts, you know, and, and really had no idea where that was going to take me or what it was going to go do. But I knew I didn't want to go work at the Four Seasons or the W uh, in like a basement kitchen for untold corporate years. And, yeah. you know, and so yachting found me, I was working at a Japanese restaurant I was modeling for a bronze sculptor just to make pay my phone bill every month. And I knew that student loans were coming up in December. And I remember thinking, holy shit, how am I going to pay for these things? You know, I can barely survive now. And, and so that when the yachting opportunity came up, I remember being scared out of my wits, not knowing what it meant, not knowing <laughs> if I could command, you know, command the, the responsibility of a, a complete kitchen. And, um, but I also knew that, I had like, this, you know, I had this little bird chirping saying, Hey, this opportunity is not one that just comes every day. And if it, you know, that saying, if it scares you do it kind of thing, I don't yep. think I was, I don't think I, I had even started to think like that yet as a, as a, as an adult, but I knew somewhere inside that because it scared the crap out of me, I was attracted to it. And so I had to yeah. chase it. So, you know, 
um, yeah, you know, I spent the next 10 years really uh, traveling through motor yachts, small boats, beach cruiser runarounds, sailboats, you know, did small stints on large 300 foot vessels. And, and over a 10 year career, just run, ran the gamut from walking docks, working in shipyards, scraping pallet loads of greasy bolts and washers, just trying to make ends meet stuck in the med trying to get home you know what i mean like hitchhiking yeah. trying to find like free delivery back home and <laughs> um you know i went through all that like living in flea infested crew houses all the way through having a terrific solid career yacht job for multiple years where you're an invested family member and it feels you know it's not just a salaried position you feel like you are an actual part of this larger dynamic um and so what, a, you know, super varied career for, for at least the time being. And I'm certain from what I've seen, um, the industry has only just continued to develop and change uh, in the 10 years that I have not been in the industry because I, I left in 2011. So. Do you, do you miss it? I mean, I, I could, I could expound upon that for the industry definitely has changed, but do you, do you miss any, any aspects of it or. I mean, your life is completely different right now. You've you've migrated. You've lost your flippers and went to land. You know, you're you're, mm -hmm. you're now you're not a polywog anymore. You've you've gone full on frog or whatever. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, sure. Like anything, there's parts I miss without doubt. Um, I feel so. My grandmother asked me a few years ago. She said, Eduardo. <laughs> We we're just catching up. And she said, Eddie, tell me. She's 93. She's like, Eddie, tell me. Are you a chef? Are you even like she didn't say even, but she was like, Are you are you a chef still? Or she's like, my my girlfriends ask me when we're playing like Mahjong, like you know, uh, what's your grandson do? We see him on the news, we saw him in People magazine, we saw him. Um, and and her call out hit a tender bone, bro, because in the last 10 years, largely, I actually have not been chefing like yeah. you do every day. And like I did for a solid 10 years as a yacht chef, the last 10 years has been spent building businesses and it requires chef skills. And I yep. have, it's almost like when you're a captain, uh, how many captains have you sat with that are just trying to figure out how to transition from being a captain and how to make those skill sets work on land so that they, you know, can change, change their, their exactly. place of being. And, sure. and that I always remember that being such a hard bridge to, to cover for folks. And I feel like for me, um, going from full-time chefing where you're cooking every day, 5 a.m. to whenever food calls end at 5 a.m., you know, you, you're just round the clock cooking for a decade and then overnight you go home and then starting a business. And so I responded to her with, I am still a chef in the sense that I feel it's a, a mantle and, and sort of like this thing that you can embody and yet uh, you know, I also said, but you can introduce me as he's a, uh, he, he owns his own business too. He's a business, business owner. Exactly. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't think you're, I mean, no one thinks any less like a chef is such a huge name and a broad umbrella group of anything. You're still in the food industry. You're still using those skills that you develop. Like you couldn't, uh, I mean, I mean, we should maybe transition into what you do now. We do. And people can rather than mysteriously talking about some entrepreneur thing that you're doing. You're, you, you've, you've made a, a group of sauces that are excellent. I, I believe in them, obviously. And, and that's your own business. And I think you started inside the family, right? Yeah. So getting to, to where I am today, I actually, I have a bad habit of this. You gotta keep me honest. you let someone will ask me a question <laughs> and I'll just take it somewhere else and never Good. answer the question. So you asked if I missed yachting. And, right. and I brought right. in the story of my grandma asking if I was still a chef. And the reason I brought yeah. that up is because I had an, a request of a past yacht owner ask if I would come chef uh, a trip in St. Bart's. And the trip had a special guest. It meant a lot to him. And ever since I had left three years prior, he hadn't really landed a new relationship with a chef that felt the same, worked the same, and made it made the whole boat come, al come alive, which is yeah. why he was a, a yachtsman, why he owned a yacht. And so I went back and I showed up uh, at the Ile de Sol Marina in St. Martin. And oh, yeah. I was kind of like percolating with excitement and like, okay. And it, 
And I remember getting to the back of the boat, about to walk on the pass rail, and I just like my body sank and my being sank and everything. Really? I just knew that it wasn't my place anymore. Like there was no more mojo in the atmosphere of the industry. Okay. It, the smell of the salt, the whipping of the lines on mass from like all the dinky marinas that sit next to the super yacht, like the noises, the smells, everything were familiar. And yet it didn't land in my passion bucket, which is why okay. I left yachting in the first place. And so do I miss it? I miss so many attractive qualities and parts to it, but I am grateful to be land-based for the last 10 years and have developed a new career here at home uh, to call my own, you know? So that's, that's a, yeah, I, I feel the opposite, even coming on this boat after almost 20 years where I really, I love the crew. Like the crew is my favorite part, just the, yeah. the people I get to work with and the dynamics and really just talking shit, the banter, it's hilarious. It cracks me up. So I haven't found anything that comes close to that yet. I want to, and I'm, you know, I always have that twitch in the back of my mind about my own business. Yeah. And, you know, maybe this here is part of what I want to do. Galley design is another, but now I'll always miss the kind of working on a boat. Like I've, and that's just a difference of opinion. It doesn't mean anything else. It's just, I love it. I still somehow love it. Well, so yeah. And you know, and, and so there, uh, we could spend, we could write a book on the 10 years spent, the hijinks, the boondoggles, the ups, the downs, the highs, <laughs> the lows. And um, so, yes, it, you know, I, I think fondly on it, and yet I, got I realize. Tony here. Yeah. Sorry about that. You're all good. Thanks, and Tony. No worries. To Thanks, Tony. First and, last. Uh, first and last. Yeah. Okay. I think we'll we'll leave this in the uh, in the video because it's just uh, I'm amongst it right now. <laughs> I got a contractor on board servicing my uh, amazing ovens. All right. Thank you very much. Of course right. you Thanks, do. Tony. Thank do you want to say hi to the camera? Just plug your head. Just just look up. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Have a great day. <laughs> See you, Tony. Thanks, man. You got my email, right? Yes, I did. I sent it back. All right, cool. Um, <clears throat> so do I miss yachting? I feel like in my current line of work, I touch on skills, accrued calluses, learning, scars, insights. Yeah. Yachting is, it is a fundamental part of how I roll right now. And, and I recognize that uh, it developed a chef that graduated from that aspect of my career to where it is now as a business owner. And, um, and yet that's, that's just a, such a fundamental quiver of skills in my pocket in, in regards to there's no time of day you can't call me to work on something, you know, like right. how, when you're on the boat, there's just a certain there's a certain sense of ever readiness that you know you can kind of begrudgingly be like it's not my shift or it's my day off or no. but the truth is, <laughs> truth is you you live on something that's not permanently meant to float you know, you know I mean like there's just something yeah. about yachting at a, as a whole you've crossed the ocean a couple times you've been through a few storms like that just doesn't happen in the kitchens and the kitchens of a restaurant, unless you own the restaurant, which is where the difference, there's a level of ownership. Yep. I think that is created by being crew on a vessel that no matter what your role and position is, you need to know how to fight a fire. You need to know how to drive yeah. a tender. You need to know yep. how to tie a line off safely without losing a limb. You, you know, like, and, and it's so, so, so like those core critical skill sets are so diverse and so out of the wheelhouse of what a executive chef at a brick and mortar is going to be thinking about. They sign off, mm -hmm. they walk away and, and the insurance policy takes care of it until they come back at 5 a.m. the next day. And so there's a certain level of just do or die that, you know, ride or die <laughs> that has stayed with me from yachting. And I've recognized yeah. that sometimes that's not, a, I have to temper that, that temper that, I have that, but maybe the team that I work with here has never lived in that scenario. They've built a right. career on sign in, sign out. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I, I love, I, lo I look fondly back at 
my time in yachting and I recognize that it still is uh, is a part of how I design furniture in my house, how I design <laughs> pocket drawers, how I utilize every single ounce of space imaginable. Um, yeah, that's definitely a, a, a boat thing where <laughs> it's just you, you can't stop once you start utilizing every single inch. You're just like, well, why wouldn't I? It's, it just seems inefficient to do it sloppily and just it's got to be perfect. I love it. I, I love, and, and you hit on something that I appreciate too about what I learned in my time. It's like that that skill set is always going to be there, and I'm very interested in applying that to something else. But I just haven't figured out anything quite yet that that I want to do as much as I want to do. Still cook food on a yacht, all over the Med, all over the Caribbean, wherever they want to go. Like I, but I'm, I like I know what you mean with that toolbox that's also crossed over into my motorcycle life too. It's that constant problem solving is what I'm addicted to. And I think I can get that same rush from a business. I just don't know which, which one yet. <laughs> Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking about how, so my business now, I don't, you know, we had, you had asked, many minutes back before we went off, you know, went off on our journey. Um, what are you doing now? What's the business sauce line, you know, um, for anyone listening to this, you know, I, I, I absolutely committed myself to yachting as an industry, not knowing and not needing to know where it was going to go or how it was going to tie up or how it was going to migrate and transition and mature within mm -hmm. my own life cycle. And what I, so seven years in, I realized that the 20 hour days, the 18 hour days, the, you know, sleeping in a bunk that was yay wide. I remember measuring <laughs> my bunk on the last boat I was on. It was a, uh, uh, it was a Trinity and from the elbow to the top of my fingers, which isn't far, 23 inches was the height from the top of the mattress to the bottom yeah. of the bunk above me. And I remember I'd like roll in, I'd roll out. My surfboard would live against the wall. If it was on charter, I'd have cases of watermelons and food. And if you bunked <laughs> with me, if you were my roommate, you know, yeah. like you Fruit knew flies. you were bunking with the chef. Cause yeah, it was just like, you know, chef Eduardo, Eduardo's room was, was kind of extension of pantry. Um, and That's so, awesome. you know, like, but, but I started to realize that I was spending my free time, not kind of hanging out at the pub, not always taking advantage of the locale and the social scenarios that are just ripe for the picking in this industry and yachting yeah. um, and, and should be taken advantage of. At some point, I was on my computer in any free time building ideas for, for this next food adventure, this next place that I wanted to share my love of food, which was, you know, a food company called Montana Mex. And um, and so that, I mean, that really became what pushed me out the door. It was, I found myself taking a dying passion, giving it room to find new, new fuel and it found new fuel in being a business owner, you know? Um, one of uh, the stewardesses are just come and taking the trash bag. So I got slightly distracted, buddy. No um, worries. The, uh, we, we, I remember that transition that like there was, it was a kind of a tumultuous time um but you had this really cool idea for a show on the food network and it was i mean you, you sent me the i remember you sent me this demo and it was a secret like a pilot and i couldn't mm -hmm. show it to anyone and it was i was like my jaw dropped i was like boom i want to watch that immediately yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and and that was it so it was it was your cup can only remain empty for so long and yet if your cup's full, it's hard to take anything new in without it spilling onto the ground as excess. And I realized yeah. that my cup, my passion cup had room to be filled. And so I woke up every day kind of with a longing, with a craving that I wasn't being satisfied with in, in the industry itself. And, yeah. um, you know, so we had sort of a percolating grain of sand in our oyster shell that friends had acclaimed our our family's salsas and our Latino, our, our Mexican inspired foods as being ter terrific. You got, you know, when can I, where can I buy this? Like you guys should, you know, and you hear that for so many years and it sticks with you. And that became the grain of sand that started our interest in making a food brand. And so I, I left the industry 
at the Palm Beach Boat Show uh, in 2011. That was sort of my last dock walk and uh, came home. I should say I, I, I seeded the business a year and a half prior and stayed in the industry to keep funding sort of the R&D process of figuring out products and, and getting, getting a team built and a business on paper built. And uh, came, so I came home in 2011 and we were a farmer's market company. We were making fresh salsas, fresh foods, Latino inspired foods, selling them at a market to no margin of profit, just like trying to figure out how to sell food to make money. You know, I just spent the last 10 years simply cooking food, had no yeah, concept totally of money. Different. Like here's a black <laughs> Darth Vader card, like go get what you need. You know, like there's yeah, no, yeah. you know, the last time I'd ever budgeted anything was in cost control class when I was 18 in cooking school, you know, and yeah. it was like this kind of totally damaging 10 year cycle of buy what you want, explore as a chef, have fun, make it tasty, right. make it on time. I need it for 20 people in five minutes. So that be, you became yeah. really good at that, right? Rabbits out of hats all day long. And so yeah. with business, you got to rabbit out of hat too, but there needs to be structure. There needs to be sort of some definitions in place and process. And um, we, we started putting those pieces together and like all good things and like all anything, um, you can't predict the weather to a T and you were mentioning the TV show concept that I had shared with you. So the, the idea was that I would leave yachting and my girlfriend at the time, business partner, had worked on a concept with me saying, okay, we're going to do a twofold approach. We're going to start this food brand called Montana Max, inspired natural Latino products for the grocery space, for the public facing space, not a brick and mortar restaurant, but like a food brand. And we're also going to create this soapbox for you as a chef to share your passion for food and the value it brings to our lives outside of a calorie count. And with those two in place, a squawk box to tell everyone how psyched you are about food and psyched you are with your approach to food as a relationship, plus a product. That's the part A and part B to Chef Eduardo remaining passionate about his connection with the world with food yeah. as the tool. I'm like, all right, that seems to make sense. Let's go try this. Having not a F an idea how to do any of it. You can swear if you want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah thanks. But I remember there's a massive adventure component to that pilot. I really yeah. connected with that. Well, because it was like, it, absolutely. So the, and the, con the television concept we called active ingredient because, you know, my theory is that we are all born we are, or we're all born with the supersized box of crayons, so to speak. And sometimes it feels like someone's giving you a crayon, like here's the indigo blue one that you didn't have. I feel like we're born with all of those colors. And yet we okay. learn through, we learn throughout our life how to access those colors to fill in mm -hmm. our life. So okay. I feel like we're born with all these tools and skills, but we learn how to access the tools and skills. And so the term active ingredient is the one ingredient in a recipe that's not, that, that is not benign. It's the catalyzing action that turns everything else into a live culture, to like brings it all to life, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you can have some sleepy things sitting together, but you add water as an active ingredient, for an example, and it creates that chemical kickoff that bring, gets things opened, activated, and alive. And so yeah. my thought was, all right, you know, I think we are our own active ingredients so that when we chase our passions, we start trending to our best way of living. And yeah. I felt like, well, the way that I can bring that to the world is through food. And the way that food most manifests and my fingertips anyway, like the way that food manifests through my fingertips in a way that is most sustainable and most attractive is when it doesn't become a burden, when it's not, oh shit, I gotta make dinner. Or, and I see this, we see this in, in homes throughout the world of just food yeah. is this crux move that gets beaten up and sort of belittled and simply not recognized for what it is. And so when I started recognize, when I started reflecting on, well, where's food most celebrated for me? It's when it's paired with a life conscious lifestyle choice that brings joy 
And so then you kind of clean that thought process up further. And I thought, well, one of my favorite expressions and ways of cooking is to make it a recreation. So have it not just be how many perfect plates of food have you delivered? How many perfect medium rare ordered steaks, easy over eggs, innumerable, right? right. Innumerable. Yeah. And yet you can take that same easy over egg order. And if all of a sudden it is cooked on a beach over coconut, like whatever wood you can find on the beach in whatever part of the world you're in, and the guests have been tendered out to the same damn breakfast that they had yesterday, but their toes are in the sand, they can smell smoke and a bird shit five feet from them. And it, they narrowly escaped that lucky drop. Now all of a sudden there has this experience that developed because like this active ingredient was added to it right so something that became so common so expected breakfast as usual thanks chef brennan you got you know the best crispy bacon ever and you're like it's just fucking crispy bacon yo you know <laughs> but so the, i uh, and so the, yeah right and, and so mm -hmm. you know that like the concept of the television show was okay i'm gonna share just simply how it is for me, how food comes to life for me. And that's in the adventurous places that I want to take food. So don't get me wrong. I'm going to go get a reservation at a restaurant. I'm going to get food to go like anybody else. Right. But I simply, the idea was, well, if we're going to go surfing, we're going to go diving, or we're out recreating in the world, skiing, snowmobiling, whatever your recreation is, bird watching. Is there an opportunity to make food part of that celebrated journey? versus cutting our adventure short so that we can go make dinner happen at a seven o'clock table time. On a podcast. Yeah, uh, that was, uh, I was listening the whole time with the chief officer was coming checking on something. Um, I remember, if I remember this correctly, from your pilot, it was something of just what you said. It was, a, it was an illustration of you and your friends, a handful of them, they went diving in the morning uh, with you, obviously. You went back to the beach, you dug a hole, built a fire, let it cool, let the fire die down, seasoned and wrapped the, the fish in banana leaf and then buried it and then went for a surf and then came back and had this amazing lunch. And, and that was, I'll never forget that scene from that pilot. I was like, man, that's, I like it. I like it a lot. And, and I think from what I understand of what you're saying, it's just like, let's not rush food. Let's not make it this like grim necessity. That, I mean, it is a necessity, but it doesn't have to be grim. Just incorporate it into something fun or, or make a day of it. Just make an entire day of it. And it brings the kind of the, the joy that can be inherent in it, but it's also very easily lost if it becomes something that's like, like you said before, oh, oh shit, I got to cook. And getting away from that is what we all need, I think. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Um, so at its baseline, that was the plan. It was all right. Leave 10 years of this, you know, how many friends, how many friends? I don't think you actually called me out on it, but I definitely had colleagues in, in the industry that just gave me the look of chase your heart, brother, but you nuts. Like you're leaving this, you know, a terrific paying, great benefit, great job. You know, and, yeah. and you know how you've been you've been in this for 20 years. So we, we all know at some point you hit a flow, you hit a you hit a different you graduate to different levels of your career. And, you know, largely at nine and a half years in when I left, I was just sort of at that place where you, you ever hear that term like you could pick or choose your job. You know, you know, you have some offers out there and you yeah. kind of like. I think I was at that place and yet so it was just almost the wrong time to leave from a career security point of view. And uh -huh. yet I just knew that for me, passion is like the number one driver. And without that in place, the foundation is not there. So I had to get going. Um, uh, knowing, knowing you and knowing what I was doing at that time as well, in terms of my motorcycle travels, I, any, any <laughs> risk that anyone wants to take my friend of mine, I, I will be a hundred percent behind you. Like I'm a dream chaser as are you. And it's like, Oh, you want to do that? The industry will be here if you need it, you know, like whatever. It's not a big yeah. deal. So uh, if anything, I would have given you huge support, especially after sending me that uh, that pilot. Um, and then my TAMMX was something that I, that, I mean, I would always wanted to do something similar to that. And I just think, uh, that, I think it's, it's really cool to watch what, what you've done and what you've gone through. It's just been incredible. And uh, to, to see one of these successful people in the industry and then leave the industry it's good, man, because we like like you said, we all come into this industry not kind of knowing where it's going to go. We're just like 
this looks cool. I'm going to do it, see where it takes. And it's a great set of dice to roll. I mean, I don't regret a minute of it. It's given me tons of time off and, and just miles all over the planet. It's, I'm very thankful for that, for my time in this industry. Will I do it forever? Of course not. I can't. I don't want to. But for now, I'm still enjoying it. And uh, But your story is one of those ones where I'm like, yeah, it looks cool over there, too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's it hasn't been you know and, and it, it uh there's so much the, the the thing is too is that um the best laid plan is still subject to you know the best case natural disaster right like it, exactly. like that's just we 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 if, if we approach the world like a wild tiger we're gonna have a much different experience than if we approach the world like a zoo a tiger lives in the zoo where everything is the same every day and you just kind of expect yeah. whereas the wild animal approach is not knowing what's going to happen remaining curious to every sound yes. sight and smell and not being afraid right in it but respecting and, 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 wild and, tiger but still walking, yeah. you know, still gonna try to walk past it every day well and 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 truth be told you know so when i was working as a yacht chef i did not have a titanium hook for a left hand and um, so in the wild shit happens. And we ha I had left the boat. I had spent the summer at home with my business partners developing our business ideas, um, developing the television show concept ideas. I had an agent that was signed with a management company. We were shopping the idea to networks. Um, and there was a, you know, we had a meeting on the books with the Food Network for, I'll just get through it out there, like October 17th. And about a week before that, I decided, you know, I was going hunting. I mean, I live in Montana. I've been an avid hunter since I was a teenager yeah. and an outdoorsman and forager. And I, uh, <laughs> It was a celebratory day. It, it was it was like you on your bike or anyone else listening doing that thing that they just love to do. Yeah. And if you're given carte blanche, you got a day off. It's the thing you choose to do. For me, in archery season, September or October in Montana, it's 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 hunting. It's filling my pantry, uh, and and it's that it's it's sort of that other layer of relationship that I have with yeah, my relationship as a chef, which is. That is my active ingredient exactly yeah. it's it's sort of having a more complete relationship with the ingredients that i cook with that bring energy to my life and others and um and yet little did i know that on that hunting trip i would come across like a metal can and in the rocky mountain west it is not uncommon to see old stoves, old detritus and leftover pieces from mining camps, sheep, sheep camps, um, homesteads. There's a lot of trash in the woods and it's out there. Yeah. And, uh, and I saw what I thought was a piece of trash, metal can, miles from the truck up in the mountains. When I looked in the can, there was kind of like, if you look at my mop of blackhead, it was filled with a mop of black fur some bones and a couple claws. And it was so natural for me to think, oh, claw, I'm gonna pick that up. I'm gonna keep moving. You know, I'm hunting, I had my bow on, my backpack, you know, kitted out for, 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 for like this engagement. Hunting is, a, is like, a, it's a pursuit, prey, predator, prey, you know, it's a pursuit. Yeah. You're, you're, it's not like you're like walking through the woods daydreaming, you know, right. um, you know, like falling asleep, you're, you're on point. And so when I saw that, it got my attention and, and, I, and I thought, well, you know, I'm going to grab a claw, throw it in, in my pack as, as a souvenir, you know, and keep, keep going. And I didn't get within 12, 15 inches of the claw, which was in the, bottle, the bottom of that can before and I had the knife in my left hand because I was going to pry it off. And, you know, 
when you, you, you felt a ton of heat on the back of my neck and you've all been in a, heard a sound check at a concert and, and that, 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 that high frequency interference noise where wires get scrambled and there's feedback and everyone recoils and gives the disgusting yeah. look to the operator like, hey, <laughs> you know, uh, that's what I heard and felt. And, and, and my next memory as a human being on earth was clouds and blue sky and, and I found myself lying on my back in the woods. You know, I, uh, I have now come to know that was October 9th, 2011. So we're, you know, trending on year 10 right now. And what I now know is that I, I was electrocuted with 2,400 volts and power that was wired to the base of that can. It was a junction point. It was just basically supposed to be a locked safe box. Yeah. With, power that was going to a backcountry cabin and i had you know like i looked at this piece of trash with a dead baby bear in it and thought piece of trash and and so that power arced from the base of that can into my knife and ended up going through into my left hand so my left hand took the brunt of it and and then it exited in nine different places on my body and i woke up on my back looking at clouds looking at blue sky wondering why i was on my back convincing myself, you know, quietly in my head, loudly in my head, however it happened. Why are you on your back? You shouldn't be on your back right now. Get to your feet. And, 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 and I did. And, and then, you know, my next memory, even after that was the sound of my feet walking on a gravel road and my vision returning to me with the valley below me, the geographic location that I was in. And, and so, so like that, simple act of just trying to pick up a claw to keep going about your day, your best life ever. And, uh, and there I was found myself walking out of the woods to save my life. Incredible. I mean, that must've been, uh, what was your mind doing at that time? Was there terror or were you just numb? Was, was shock? Well, you, you must've been in shock and you just, you went into reflex survival mode. I, uh, I, I, if anyone's to get deeper into it, I gave a TEDx talk about my takeaway yeah. from that walkout. It's like 15 minutes. Uh, Eduardo Garcia, Big Sky TEDx, I think, if you search I'll it. Put a, I'll and, put a link in the description. Okay. Um, and, and I summed it up in that 15 minute conversation. And, and yet here, it, I left everything at the site. I left my backpack, my bow, my keys, my cell phone, my wallet. I found myself, my food, my water. So like all of these things that I knew I had with me that I could survive in, in the wood if, if I had to save my life. And I left all of them there. Wow. The only thing I brought with me, I found myself walking out on this road with a can of bear spray in this hand Smart. and walking. Yeah. I, big time grizzly bear country where I live in Montana. And, um, and so when you ask what's what was going through my mind, it wasn't call 911 because the phone was up on the hill. It wasn't yeah. get your keys so you can drive yourself to the hospital. It was so past that. It was so prior to that. It was in this category that I feel I've only ever experienced maybe when I was born, which is a moment in time where there's no other noise. There's no noise at all. There's just very clearly understood commandments, which is yeah. get help. Live. Don't stop walking, get help. And that's, that is the noise that was going. That is all I heard on my walkout was I recognized that my hand was black. The left hand was black and kind of crunched up like this. Yeah. Um, and I had it up against my chest and I made a quick sling out of it to support it. I saw that it was burnt. I was walking on this road. I had nothing else with me thinking, why am I here? Why am I walking? What's going on here? And then I pieced together that I had heard that sound. I had seen that can. Oh, I went to get a claw. I felt the heat on it. Like it was warm. It was noisy. Oh shit. Did I get it? I sounded like electrical interference in, in real time. It probably took a couple seconds for me to realize this in my head. It was a conversation of minutes 
And, and I realized that I was gravely injured that, you know, that I, yeah. so surreal, beyond surreal. And, and that's where I, I kind of referenced that it felt like I was, people say they were born again, you know, when they have a life mm -hmm. and death experience. And I feel like how that, how that came about for me was simply that nothing else mattered except for life or death. And they were both in front of me to the point that yeah. on, you know, I'm a, I'm a off road walker. So if, if we go hang in the woods, if you were coming and hang in Montana today, we may take a trail, but more than likely we're going to go off trail and we're going to go explore. And yet on the walk out of the woods that day, I remember seeing the valley floor was three miles down in that way. And that's where the homes were. That's where vehicles were on the road. That's where I'd find help. And there was open hillside country, rocks, bushes, grass, rabbit holes, gopher holes, all of these obstructions. It was like an, it was like American Ninja Warrior was in front of me. He's like, okay, here's an obstacle oh, no. course. How do I get from here to there? Because yeah. I got to save my life right now. And I remember it being such a conflicting moment of, well, the fastest way to get there is to just draw a straight line and bomb down this hill. And yet, as I was shuffling one foot in front of the other, simply managing to progress towards help at one step at a time, I feel like the smarter, wiser self-preservation voice won that battle. The typical Eduardo voice was, and this is like human training, quicker, faster, cheaper, stronger, sweeter, let's go. Right. We yeah. want that. We're trained to think that way. Give me the easy option. Give me the quick option. And yet the moral of this story is that something greater told me, hey, it may get you there. Quick. You, you may think that, but if you trip on any of those obstacles, you're never, you're not going to get up off that ground again. You're going to be toast. Yeah. And so the better was, voice of reason said, like, you know, the Aesop's fable, the tortoise and the hare, like yeah. the better voice of reason said, be the tortoise. Take yeah. the winding, slow road that traverses down this mountain and put one foot in front of the other and do not stop walking. It was, was like thinking. almost like primal wisdom because like, you could have met a person on the road, but if you got stuck between the two switchbacks, all over. And that's what, and that's what I was saying. It was like it, it was it was a moment of thinking clear of any accrued experience. I mean, yes, it's all there in your back mind, and yet. The only thing that existed was simply self-preservation. What do you have to do to stay alive in this very moment? And it was just walk, walk and breathe, walk and breathe. Don't give up. And as you're telling the story, it just occurred to me that other than your documentary charge, which I'm also going to put a link in the comments. It's amazing. I've, I've, I've never really heard the story from your mouth other than mm. on, in that movie and on the video. So I think it's something that I never really wanted to um, like bother you with it or re relive it with you unless it came up naturally. It, it's just, mm. um, it's, it's, I remember what I was doing at the time when all this was happening to you. And I just, uh, I just appreciate you, man. I'm just glad you're still here because this is something mm. that, and, and okay, and however, wherever you want to take this right now, but what you've done since this has and how many people you've helped and how many more people you plan to help it's i mean it's incredible and i think when it's happened to you i said like I mean, you know you're gonna make this your bitch and and i know there's there's a ton of pain and struggle and i don't mean to dismiss it but uh i knew you would like i i saw that imprint in your personality before this happened to you dude i knew it good to hear it it's good to hear it i uh there's a lot of fear and noise that happens in, in, our, in, in my head, I think in our minds um, daily. You can't do this. You're not good enough. It's never going to happen. Yeah, and, you're an imposter, um, all that shit. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I felt there was – so I survived I'm here today. Hi, 2021. Uh, so I survived that event in 2011, and – and in the last 10 years has since from then to today has been rebuilding, has been a very complex and challenging emotional and communal process of putting pieces back together, which took years and then finding your purpose again, because can I cook again? 
you know how, how am i going to do that again how am yeah. i going to how am i going to freaking open an avocado shit you know yeah. like yeah. so all those things i remember googling googling amputee chefs cooking with prosthetics while i was still in icu while i was still in my bed yeah. i had never even put a prosthetic on just you know just how, how do people do this i got to figure this out and and i took every pursuit and plugged it in with amputee as the tagline how to surf as an amputee Bethany Hamilton <laughs> pops up. How to cook as an amputee. You know, the chef uh, in Yeah, the one mission star. In, yeah, yeah. Yes, you've got yeah, it. I can't remember his name. And yeah. It's, yeah, and and he is. He's a one mission star chef in England. And and I, of course, you know, I like watched his YouTube video. I was like, I can flip a, I can do that. Like, okay, I can do this. I can do this. Like, I can do it, you know. And um, and yet what what's transpired in the last 10 years is that out of, basically out of the ashes of this total combustion of a life's like mission or purpose and direction has been, they say that farmers burn their fields to add carbon to the soil, it feeds the earth. And it's like an integral part of a cycle. That's why, you know, forest fires. And so I feel like my life prior composted into that heap and what came out of that heap Again, I was saying nothing was the only thing I was thinking about was the core, like similar thinking as to being that new babe taking first breaths for the first time. The yeah. purity of that moment sort of put me back into the next 10 years of just, I got to just figure out how to be me again. I got to figure out how to, you know, brush my teeth out, knocking my freaking tooth out, you know, okay, so I don't use right. string floss anymore, you know, I use a pick, like, you just, I had to learn these fundamentals again. Yeah. And, and, and then, you know, so what's come out of it is that we decided as a team of business partners that the Montana Mex food brand concept was still valid. It was still a worthwhile pursuit. So we kind of put that out into the focus of the future. So we'll still work on that. Um, the work on television work, you know, the purpose of that was still valid. I want to inspire people to have a better relationship with food and unto themselves and to others. So that remained valid. And then all of a sudden there was this whole third element that was not really in my wheelhouse prior to my injury, which was, I figured my way to support the world and help others and give back was through food as a chef. And, and we can easily feel that way when you serve someone a morsel and they're like, mm, and you just fed their, you fed their, their, their kind of, you know, feel good meter or, or, or you're working with um, someone that has a special diet and now you just fed their special need meter. And so all of a sudden I, this injury brought a whole new platform, a whole new place to, continue to try and impact the world. So it was a, it was a benefit a blessing that I, I, I didn't think would come from this naturally. And yet what happened is all of a sudden I was no longer just talking to food focused worlds, but I was connecting with trauma worlds. I was connecting with um, the world of folks dealing with their health, which is connected to food. So it all, it all ends up tying up to what I do now. And yet little did I know that the last 10 years would include having a documentary film made about my injury and life having, which is incredible. A, thank you. Um, because uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but because you were already kind of thinking about television and doing a food show, was the reason why you guys recorded most of what happened while you're in, you know, going through surgery after surgery after surgery. I mean, was that the kind of the driving force behind that part of it? The documentation? I, um, exactly. So we, 2010, we started, Jen and I, Jenny Jane uh, was my girlfriend at the time, friend, business partner, and we had developed the t TV concept and while I was still yachting in the med Caribbean doing kind of the cycle, uh, we'd picked up a lens camera and started to film B roll or lifestyle, like supporting content to support a, a professional pitch. And so we did not have a show with any network yet. We had a managing company and agency. And so when I got electrocuted, it just seemed like a natural fit to just simply keep documenting life keep going. as it was happening. And, and that was really, that was, it was, I think it was Jen that had that initial idea. And, um, 
And so it was Jen, Jen actually filmed all of our 50 some odd stay in ICU. And I feel that most definitely brought a tremendous value to the documentary charged yeah. um, in that most documentaries that deal with trauma are, or a lot simply have to recreate a moment. Yeah. And, and we had that footage that was raw, irreplaceable. Yeah, it's, I can't encourage you guys enough to, to go check that out. It is, you'll get emotional, you'll get inspired. It's, uh, honestly, I can't speak to enough of your character to, to go through that. And then we haven't even gotten into uh, what you do with the Challenge Athletes Foundation. I think you said you have, the other day you told me you have a planned fundraiser to do with the, the same Utah burn unit, um, for probably one of the most famous in America, I think you said. Well, yeah, the Utah, the University of Utah Burn Unit, which is where I stayed, um, and you know, I, I feel like is a, is a leading burn trauma, you, you know, care unit in in the world yeah. globally, definitely in the United States. Um, but you know, yeah, I, I had mentioned how the last ten years was filled with this third element that I never never really saw coming, and mm -hmm. and so I feel like. There's a lot to unpack here. And at a high level, I did not recognize that this was going to be a part of my body, like part of me. I, I tried to be brave and I tried to be, you know, like bring that Eduardo Moxie to my recovery and my community and my business partners and my relationships of I'm good. And because I'm going to be strong, you can be good. And then we're going to be good. And it's all going to be fine. And um, that can only take you so far. I, I realized that at some point I wasn't owning the fact. Like I think, I think it was 2013, two, two and a half years after my initial injury, that I recognized there was this void that was not being filled within me. There was a wound that was not being healed, and it was the lack of ownership that I was an amputee. I was still just trying to, you know, like hide it in a way. Yeah. Like that, that's how it transpired is that my, my actions and my reality was hiding the reality, which is I am an amputee. That's just simply a definition of someone missing a part of their body, you know, it's just a normal and reaction. I would imagine. Totally. But when you're yeah. new to it at 30 years just, old, you're you like, think oh, you're going through it alone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're like, you're like, what are you talking about? I'm Eduardo, you know? And yeah. yet what happened was, is that it was actually, I had an invitation to go to, a fundraiser in New York City um, from the Challenge Athletes Foundation, an organization in San Diego that um, raises, it's a nonprofit that supports anybody that lives with a physical challenge of some kind to get involved in an active lifestyle through sports. And they help, but with grants to, you know, if someone wants to play wheelchair rugby, they can help you get a wheelchair rugby seat, you know? chariot oh, they call it badass chariot yeah, um, Roman. And, you know and <laughs> and so they reached out to me and i was like i, I was just like gosh I, I don't feel like i'm an athlete but i'm intrigued by this because i feel like there's something missing in my life right now so i took that call i went to new york and before the big evenings event they had a fun run in central park so i showed up at the mm. fun run with my prosthetic on shorts t-shirt ready to go and I hadn't really ran since my injury. So I'm missing four ribs right here. I'm still missing them on my left side. And I hadn't ran, you know, in the two and a half years. And so I was curious, how am wow. I going to locomote? How is my torso going to move? And so I, I kind of had a lot of trepidation. I roll up to the Central Park run and uh, there was a mess of people there, a bunch of people having bagels and coffee, getting ready to go. And there, a young man was introduced to me, Thomas Kane is his name. And he, he is and was then a challenge athlete. And he was introduced to me. And the first thing I noted was he was a little younger than me. I was 30 something, he was 18. And yet I noticed that he had his left arm exposed. He had a t-shirt on and he had, he was, his amputation was like right here where mine is, midway on the forearm. And yet he wasn't wearing a prosthetic. And so I, I kind of roll up and I'm like, that's weird. Where's your prosthetic? I didn't say that, but he rolled up to me and he was like, and he did say the opposite. He said, that's yeah. weird. Why are, why are you wearing your prosthetic, bro? Cause you're about said, to go for a run. Yeah. He's, he's like, Hey, nice <laughs> to meet you, Eduardo. I'm Thomas. And he just immediately went from looking at me to looking at my prosthetic to looking at me. Yeah. And he just called it. He's like, are you going to run with that thing? And, and what happened is he, 
he was my active ingredient in that moment, right? He did yeah. not hold back on what he knew his power was, which was to be real and honest and, and loving. And so he brought it and it helped me crack into my power, which was I had not given this power yet. I had basically removed it from the conversation of self. And so he called me out. It's like, yeah, noted. I guess I'm not owning this. So took my shirt off, showed all my scars off. All the scars. Yeah, yeah, totally. And, 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 and I took this off. I put my shirt on, whistle blew, everyone runs, you go to keep up. And all of a sudden I'm running and I'm moving. And I'm like, okay, my ribs don't feel too weird. And you're right. It's kind of cool not having this thing glanging and chanking and like moving around. And, and, and the rest is kind of history is that kickstarted this understanding that, and as I've always known, but it would just to be your best self, you know, you, you, it's just so important to recognize the stuff that you're in love with and the stuff that scares you. Um, and, and so from there, this third element came to life, which was, okay, I have an opportunity here to do what Thomas just did to me. You know, he just helped right. me come through Pass this trauma. I, I have an opportunity to now kind of help others here. And, and, you know, my agent had been saying, write a book, make a film. Friends had been saying, write a book, make a film. And I pushed back, pushed back, pushed back because I didn't want to share it with the world. And in that moment of yeah. reality and awareness, that ownership moment, it just started this, what is now part of my life, which is to be an open platform, not just about my love of food, but my belief in recognizing our scars, our challenges, our unique yeah. hardships and sharing them with the wor world and and, you know, it kind of boils down to like three points is recognize, recognize what the pinch point is and own it, own the shit out of it. Mm -hmm. Second is communicate that, that ownership, communicate it with the world. I own that. I don't have a hand. It's hard for me. And I'm really looking for feedback like this, or I don't even know where to start, but just simply get the communication. Once you've resigned yourself to own it, get it out there. That's step two is just like share it with the world, communicate it. And then step three is be open to collaboration, which means giving up some control and letting others yeah. fill in, fill that cup, right? So, yeah. so that's, that's currently sort of one of the sweetest parts about of what I do now as, as a living being on this earth is working towards my own selfish pursuits of living a life that I can be proud of and leaving a legacy that I feel is gonna have impact. And yet also being brave enough to stand and support others uh, as an example so that they can make it through that same crux move that I'm so grateful that I was able to, you know? Yeah, I, I haven't seen Charged um, in a while, maybe even since it came out. And, and that leads to how powerful this moment was for me because I'm not bullshitting you on this, is that when you and some other amputees were out um, basically teaching each other how to surf together with one board and, and, and that, that hit for whatever empathy button in me, I was like, holy shit, they feel insecure about going into the water as amputees and learning how to surf with a whole beach watching. I'm like, oh my God, that's so unnecessary. You know, like it would be hard enough. And, but you're, it was cool. You're, you're, you guys are laughing and having a good time and you don't give a fuck. And it was just such a beautiful part of that movie. I'll, I'll never forget it. It was awesome. And that's exactly what you were talking about in terms of like, let's all just be okay with this. It's fine. It, it is. And, and it's, 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 and so, it, and it's also become, um, you know, so now I'm a spokesperson with the challenge athletes foundation. Um, the food brand Montana Max is now no longer at farmer's markets where, you know, sold in, you know, have been in the grocery space for years and um, have our own online marketplace. And yet three, three, four years ago, we included the challenge athletes foundation as our charity partner of choice and they're on our label proudly. It's amazing. And so again, you know, the business pursuit was, I want to inspire folks to rethink how, what the relationship is with food. The injury comes in, it doesn't change. It doesn't change the core focus. It simply just added a little garnish on top, which is yeah. let's create, let's light this bonfire and others to really have a relationship with their food. And let's also make sure that there's a do good element here that moves the needle in this larger way. 
I mean, it's total, total love language for Eduardo, you know, like, how do we do more? <laughs> yeah. How do we get more out of our day? How do we maximize the bejeebus out of this? And, yeah. and so, um, you know, I'm pretty grateful for the way that chips have landed, um, for sure has not been without its fair share of, you know, maxed credit cards and, uh, challenges and learning, you know, like pain, pain points of learning, but, um, I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't go back. Not for her. That's heartbeat. amazing. It's amazing to, to watch you. I mean, if you're just meeting Eduardo today or if, or if you've seen this stuff before, but it was amazing to watch you go through all this and you just kind of like, like you said, you've burned down and then you've risen like a Phoenix out and, and not with just strength for yourself, but strength for other people to help them go through the same thing. That's amazing. I'm getting like emotional just talking about it. I'm super proud of you, man. Yeah. Super proud of you. Thanks brother. Yeah. Um, hey, note to editor, I have a, it's 1157. So I got this call in three minutes that I can't get out of. Um, but I'm happy to call this part one of two. If, Excellent. If, if yeah, we, let's do it again. We need to follow I'll up. I just feel like, I yeah. feel like we just kind of, we're halfway there. Um, yeah. You know, so I apologize, but I feel like because we have the control of start and stop in this. Um, yeah. Well, we could call this episode one and then, you know, a month down the line, we, we, we follow up rather than making it all one. But we okay. can talk about that. Well, if, if you want to, if, if we want to wrap this then with any constructive wrap that uh, a producer somewhere can make sense of, then let, let's, let's do it. Yeah, let's, uh, let's wrap it up. I mean, I was completely irresponsible and just having fun chatting you, so I didn't really look at my notes. Um, hmm. I, I had a wrapping up with a fundraiser in Utah. But um, yeah, I mean, let's just we can we can come back in at any point. I'll, I'm going to be the one editing, editing it, uh, editing it. Um, well, then then but, let's uh, not rush it, Brandon, because I this call in two minutes. Um, I don't want to get into a place where I we get deep and 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 then get a yank back out of it. So okay, we could re-listen to the last ten minutes of it and know where we got to pick this up again. You know? Yeah, sure. Yep. Yeah, let's do that rather than trying to like do some weird two minute. Yeah, I know you got to go. So well, look at this too. See the where I sit in my basement. You see this like white patch coming here? <laughs> Same time of day. <laughs> Same time of day. It's usually around noon. It starts creeping through this window well and it like yep. lights me up. So then I got to change where I'm sitting. And uh, <laughs> and I know that'll just affect. Uh, so we're at two o'clock. We too. started about one. But if it, yeah. I mean, like I said before, I'm not looking for absolute perfection. I just want just to be normal and natural instead of, you know, TV quality. I just wanted to um, just get your story out there, man. I just think it falls into what I think is interesting in life and what things I appreciate about humans. Uh, yeah, much respect, dude. Yeah. yeah. All right, homie. I know you got to go. It's been a pleasure, and uh, we will do this again. All right. Much up. Catch you soon. See you, man. Like I said, that was part one. There's more coming. We talked about it, and um, as you saw, and we actually just did it. So I just finished uh, chatting with Eduardo again, and uh, it's very nice to catch up with an old buddy that has been through a lot, lots of um, wisdom and insight that I think we can all take from the lessons that he learned the hard way. And it was a very good time catching up with him. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Get the fork out. Thank you.